So um, we're talking about the bony thorax and the vertebral column today. So I've asked my friend Elvis to join me. I just have to try to get us in the right frame here. Okay, so I'll try to demonstrate things as we go. Um, I think I put a student version in. There's two things you could do with that student version. One, um, you could choose to fill it in as we go or to use it to test your knowledge. See if you can fill it in um, from what you have in your head after the fact. And then you could always access, um, access the original, the teacher version if you needed. Okay, so um, we're gonna talk about the spinal column. We wanna be able to label all the sections, cervical, thoracic, lumbar, sacrum, coccyx. We also wanna label um, individual pieces of an individual bone. So bone markings. Um, they serve purpose, and so we want to talk about those in order to be able to talk about their purpose. Um, we're also going to be talking about the bony thorax. There's not a lot of terms to use in the bony thorax, so we'll talk about the ribs and um, the sternum, the breastbone. So here you can see the major regions of um, the vertebral column, the cervical, the thoracic, lumbar, and um, this is our sacrum and coccyx, making up the pelvic um, curve. You have seven cervical vertebrae, 12 thoracic, and five lumbar. So just um, like a mnemonic you can use for that is the time most people eat meals. So usually you have breakfast at seven. And so that's going to be your cervical. You have lunch at noon, and that's your um, thoracic. And then you have dinner at five. So that's your lumbar. Okay. So um, our vertebral column. Okay. So... Um, we have 26 bones in the adult vertebrae column. You have 33 in the in the youngsters. Um, several of the bones will fuse together. So down here in the sacrum and the coccyx, these are both made of multiple bones. So originally um, you have 33 cartilage um, is connecting each of those. Your whole skeleton starts out as a cartilage actually. Um, so those those bones in the sacrum and the, and the coccyx, they'll fuse together. And so that's how we go from 33 to 26. So I think you wanna know that for the test. It surrounds and protects the spinal cord. So I'm gonna show you some example vertebrae as we go. Um, this hole here is where your uh, spinal cord would go through. This hole here does not exist. This is just there because it holds it on the model. So you gotta ignore that one. So this is the one we're talking about when we talk about the spinal cord. So it protects the spinal cord. All these bones are held into place via ligament. So our vertebrae is very flexible due to um, the joints in between each of the vertebrae and then the opening in the uh, um, spinal column. Okay, so let's keep going here. Some vertebral landmarks. Um, so this is when you're looking at an individual vertebrae. So you have this arch right here and your lab book will talk about it being made up of three pieces, the pedicle, the lamina, and the spinous process. For me, really just know the arch. So right here, this is what we're looking at when we say the arch. And right now, um, I think it's important to know, like this is your the front of it. And this is the back, the pointy part. Um, and so when I show you it like this, you're looking down on it, okay? So um, the lamina is, uh, this is the pedicle portion and then the lamina is over here. But like I said, I just care that you know the arch. The body is the main portion of the spinal or of the vertebrae. This is what is going to bear the weight, okay? Then you have, um, so that's facing front. The body is facing you. In between you have intervertebral discs, the intervertebral discs here in between the vertebrae that's cartilaginous, um, slightly movable joints. Um, the vertebral foramen is the hole I was pointing at earlier. That's what the um, spinal cord passes through. And then um, a few more. The transverse process are, transverse remember means horizontal, side to side. So they're sticking out the sides. So muscles of your back connect to them as well as the ribs here in the thoracic region. Um, I think you can see the thoracic or the transverse processes here. You also have nerves sticking out in this model, but 
um, the bones sticking out to the side, those are the transverse. And then you have a spinous process, which is the pointy portion out the back. So if I look at him, I can see all spinous process. And these are things that you're gonna look at to kind of differentiate which area um, a bone comes from. And then you have inferior and superior articular processes. So remember articular means joints or adjoining. So this right here is an articular process that sticks up and then there's another one that sticks down. So if you're looking at it from the back, you have the inferior articular process there and the superior articular process there. So um, when you're looking at the vertebrae, if you can see this one here, you have the superior um, articular cartilage and art, or, I'm sorry, articular process and articular just means joint. Um, so that's where these two vertebrae form a joint. Okay, so now we're going to talk about each section. So we're going to start with the cervical up there in the neck. We know cervical means neck and it has seven vertebrae in the cervical region and two of them get special names and I had 3D printed these, but I haven't found them in my boxes yet. So I can't show you the two together. I have one of them. Okay, so you have the atlas and the axis. The first vertebrae way up here, this is the atlas, like a globe. And the atlas doesn't have any body, as you can imagine, that would really impede the movement of your head. Um, it does, however, have two receiving points for those occipital condyles we talked about at the base of the skull. That's what allows you to nod your head, um, yes, up and down. The axis, so you wanna think the atlas rotates on its axis, right? The globe rate rotates on its axis. So this is the axis and you can see this special feature, the dens um, sticking up. So then the atlas rotates on it, so right and left. And that's what allows us to shake our head or turn our head. Um, that's considered a pivot joint. So vertebral bones are named according to their region and then which number they are within that region. So C is for cervical, T thoracic, L lumbar, S sacral. So you would refer to um, T1, T2, T3. So if you had a, a subdisc between C6 and 7, it would be between 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, between the 6th and 7th vertebrae. So that's something you might hear in your lifetime, when, just when you go to the doctors. Any one of these is referred to with a, a letter and a number, okay? Um, so I already mentioned the dens, which is also called the odontoid process. So that is what the atlas will rotate on. <clears throat> so here you can see the cervical vertebrae. You can see um, their spinous process, they point downward which is very helpful if we're able to move our head. You can imagine if these were straight out the back, it would be hard to tilt our head back. Um, a couple other special features that you won't find in other vertebrae, but you will find in um, the cervical vertebrae are these transverse foramen. So again, remember you're looking at it going this way but I'm gonna show you it from the top because it's easier to see. The transverse form, and that's what your jugular and carotid arteries go through. Your jugular vein, your carotid arteries. So they go up through there to service the, the brain, and the skull. Um, another special feature, the notched portion of the spinous process. So your other vertebrae don't have that notch and I don't think it's as easy to see. It doesn't know what to focus on really. Um, it's not as easy to see here, but there's the notch right there. And you won't have that in other vertebrae. So if I put a bunch of vertebrae on a quiz, you would be able to tell me which is which because you would look at those special features, the notch, the spinous process, the transverse foramen. Here we are in the thoracic region, the, the chest area, right? Anything front, back, that whole region is the thoracic area. Spinal uh, or the vertebral, um, the skeleton, one of its main job is to protect the organs inside, right? So it's gonna protect the heart and the lungs. It connects to the ribs on the side. You can see here on the transverse process connecting to the ribs. Um, it's built for stability, not so much um, flexibility. The um, vertebral discs are thinner 
in the thoracic region, which means injuries, you could be more prone to, to injuries in the thoracic region. Um, so special features of this one are um, a heart-shaped body. So this has a heart-shaped body. These are bad because that hole is not there. And also the circular foramen. So you'll notice that in your T1 through T12. Also notice all these downward projecting um, long spinous process. So they're probably the ones you feel if you felt somebody on the back and you're like, ooh, you have a bony back. You probably feel those spinous processes. Okay, so here's a good picture of that downward long, long um, spinous process. They articulate with your ribs and the lumbar supports the weight of your body. So um, the lumbar are going to be much thicker. There he is. Um, they have a really big body, very thick. Notice its spinous process out the back is very thick, robust, blunt. It's not pointed, okay? Um, instead of a circular, we had our circular um, foramen, right? Instead of circular, I have a triangular foramen. And that's going to help me identify the lumbar vertebrae. So those are the largest. Um, lots of back injuries have to do with your lower back. The back is made for, or the lumbar is made for flexion and extension. So flexion is decreasing an angle at a joint. So this is a flexion and this is increasing it. This is beyond 180. So that's an extension rather than rotation. So I just showed you those already. The um, robust spinous process, the thick body, and the triangular shaped vertebral foramen. The sacrum down here between the hips. So between the hips, we have our sacrum. There we go. Um, it's made up of a handful of bones that have fused together. So this is where we went from 33 to 26. It's um, connected with both of our um, pelvic girdle. Well, it is our pelvic girdle as a whole. It's um, connected with both of our ilium. So you might hear the SI joint, sacroiliac joint. So in the yellow, you have that. The coccyx is the tailbone. It gets its name because it is the remnants of a vestigial tail. So... Um, that's where the name comes from. And again, this is a number of fused bones, usually three to five. To me, it reminds me of like the tip of a rattlesnake. Like it reminds me of the rattle on the rattlesnake's tail. But back in the day when they were naming everything, the Greek thought, we use Greek and Latin for most of our science words. They thought it looked like the lateral view of a cuckoo bird's beak. And so that's where the coccyx come from, comes from its name has to do with the cuckoo, okay? So I'm gonna take a moment to evaluate. Um, do we have any questions so far? We've looked at regions of the spine and then um, features of each type of spine. Before I keep going, any questions on that portion? Okay, so we'll move on into the curvature piece. Okay, so you have primary curvatures and secondary curvatures. Primary, you probably recognize that means first. And secondary, you know that means second. So the primary curvatures we have are here in the thorax and the sacrum, thorax and sacrum, because they were formed in the womb. So, you know, in the womb, you were curled up in a, in a ball. So any of those forward curvatures are from that time. The secondary curvatures happened after you were born. So when the baby starts trying to hold the weight of his head, you know, it gets all wobbly. Um, the weight of the head starts to pull the head backwards. And so that's where you see this curvature beginning to reverse its direction. So this is a secondary curvature. The same thing happened when we started walking. So the weight of our body put the pressure on our spine and it started pulling us backwards there as well. So those are both secondary curvatures. 
So those are okay to have. What are not okay to have is exaggerations or horizontals. So this guy currently has scoliosis. He got beat up in the gym during storage over the summer and he needs some chiropractic work. But scoliosis is a horizontal, not terribly uncommon, a horizontal curvature. Kyphosis is hunchback. So if you've seen people that have a back kind of like that, so it's an exaggerated um, thoracic curvature. Lordosis is an exaggerated lumbar. And I tried to demonstrate that last hour and it didn't look like I was at, at all showing you what it looked like. So I'm not going to, um, but it's way back. So just picture the lumbar being really deep. And that would give you that. Lordosis, I think of a pot belly. So the Lord can eat all he wants. And so his belly gets real big, which pulls his spine forward. And so that creates that um, sway back look. Okay, so we're gonna go into the thorax and um, we'll get our demonstrator here again. So the bony thorax, we already did the thoracic vertebrae, but then we also have the ribs and the sternum. So we wanna look at the ribs and the sternum next. The coastal cartilage, anytime you see coastal or costal, um, there's intercostal muscles, intercostal cartilage. Um, that term costal is going to refer to the rib cage. Okay, so um, we already talked about the fact that it's going to protect the internal organs like the heart and the lungs. It connects the upper limbs um, with, well, the um, shoulder girdle will connect with the rib cage to attach the upper limbs. The shoulder girdle is not part of the axial skeleton. Our clavicle does articulate with our sternum, however. Okay, so the sternum itself is made of three components, the manubrium up here, the body of the sternum and the xiphoid process. So we wanna label each of those, the manubrium here. So to me, it looks like a man's tie. And I think who wears a tie, a man, manubrium. So that helps me remember that the knot of the tie is the manubrium. And then um, that is our connection with the clavicle. The body of the sternum is the main portion and the xiphoid is this little piece at the bottom. So we have um, ribs that are either considered true or false, depending on their connection to the sternum. Um, so they connect with the transverse processes of the thoracic vertebrae in the back and the sternum in the front. So the true ribs, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, these have a direct connection with the sternum. So the cartilage directly connects it. Um, and so they're considered true. Below that, we have five sets of faults. I'm going to, I'll change that. I used to say it differently. Five sets of false ribs. So these they have one piece of cartilage that attaches to another piece of cartilage before they connect to the sternum. So they have a false connection. And so they're considered false. And actually all five, eight, nine, eight through 12 are considered false. The last two are called floating because they have no um, connection in the front at all. So if I look from the back, I can see there's no anterior connection with this vertebrae here, or I'm sorry, this rib. Um, or this one here. So they don't touch the sternum at all. So they're considered false and floating. <laughs> so they characterize in that and then the subcategory. Okay, and then the intercostal is the space in between. So enter is in between. The muscles of the, the intercostal muscles are what bring your rib cage up when you're breathing and down when you're exhaling. Okay, so I put a circle in and um, so this circle is going to be my haversion canal, my central canal. And then, um, so then, so I got my haversion canal and then each of the circles outside of it, these are called lamella. So then I'm gonna put some cells in on my lamella. So some spaces for my cells to sit, these are gonna be lacuna. So I think it's helpful, these kind of things, if you just draw them, it kind of looks like an atom the way I'm drawing it. But so I just put in a bunch of lacuna, they're on the edges. 
And then inside of my lacuna, I'm going to have some osteocytes. I'll make them black. So I'm going to put my osteocytes inside of each of those. So I got most everything drawn. And then, so that's where I say like relationships, right? Be able to describe as you go. And then um, let's draw some lines. And these are going to then be the, um, let's do green. These are gonna be like canaliculized. Oh, I can't do squiggly lines. I'll work on figuring out squiggle lines, but these are like connecting to the blood supply. So all the little lines that you see are canaliculized. Oops. Does that help? Like just taking it apart one piece at a time? Yeah, Maybe so, I... um, huh? So like the whole circle is called an osteon, right? Yeah, the whole, so the whole thing together is the osteon. Mm -hmm. So okay, yeah. this in the square is, a, is the osteon as a whole. Or a herversion system, also known as. So if I were to do the other type of bone, it has odd shapes. So what I just drew was the trabeculae. It's filled with matrix. This is filled with matrix. So like if the material itself, whatever color the picture takes, that's matrix. Um, so the same thing, but let's use pink. So we're filling, oops, I got a little crazy. All of the material, that's matrix. Okay. And then um, we got like, all these polka dotted business out here, that's the bone marrow. So it's not solid. And then inside we have lacuna, pits, lacuna, 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 lacuna. And now the cells don't fill up these lacuna quite as much. So then inside a lacuna, I'll put a cell, osteocytes, osteocytes. So these things that you can't really see, I think it's good to practice drawing them yourselves and then you identify, you're better able to identify what each thing is. Did that make a little more sense even though it doesn't look like the actual drawing?